So thank you, uh, Esther and Amy, for the opportunity to be here uh, to speak uh, in this symposium. Uh, and Esther, congratulations uh, on the award. Uh, I think it is very well deserved, and it was really great to see that uh, you have received the recognition. Um, I'm going to be changing gears a little bit, and um, rather than talking about more inorganic materials, uh, I'm going to be talking more about organic materials and what one may be able to do with organics and polymers uh, for energy applications. All right, so I'd like to start, if I can get the cap on, all right, with, if we look at polymers uh, in electronics and photonics, uh, they play a role in, can play a role in a number of different areas. And in particular, there's the promise for uh, large area, high volume, uh, low cost throughput using additive processing. Uh, now that's the hope. There's a long way to go from where we are today to be able to reach that hope. And there are a number of things that have to fall into place, uh, starting with just understanding fundamental materials and pro uh, materials structural properties, um, how materials perform and how one can manipulate the structure, uh, but more importantly, understand also the, the relationship between material structure and materials processing how, and how that influences uh, a thin film as it is being produced, and then how all those come together to influence device performance. Uh, so there are two key pieces that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the first one relates to designing uh, new materials and processes that may have uh, better performance attributes. Uh, the other piece uh, is recognizing that organic materials uh, aren't necessarily the best uh, technology-wise in terms of performance. Uh, are there some alternative uh, sort of modular aspects that one can design that could help uh, improve the performance of those organics? And again, these are strictly um, on the fundamental side. Um, in the research arena, and I don't believe anywhere near sort of technology implementation at this point, but interesting to think about, and can the approaches stimulate some additional research that could lead to a viable technology? All right, so materials and processes. Um, let's think about what we may be able to do in terms of design and synthesis. All right, so on the right is a little bit of a cartoon um, looking at um, some uh, polymer structures that um, have been developed in my own labs uh, where we've been using an electron deficient benzothiodiazole unit uh, with an electron rich uh, thiophene unit uh, within a copolymer structure. All right, so through uh, this uh, donor acceptor uh, copolymer material, uh, we can uh, get decreased electron density uh, that may improve the ambient stability of the material, uh, which is going to be very important for any kind of polymer or organic material to be used in an energy application. Also, the DA hybridization uh, can narrow the band gap um, between, uh, use through intramolecular electronic coupling, uh, and that can improve uh, the absorption characteristics uh, and therefore the uh, efficiency of a device uh, that would be using these materials. All right, and then uh, there could be <coughs> improved intermolecular interactions uh, because we have this heteroaromatic unit uh, that's sort of a fused structure in the middle, and that's the in blue uh, the uh, benzothiodiazole unit. All right, and, and so we've uh, done the synthesis of these materials, we've done a little bit of processing, uh, and we've started to do some device characterization. All right, so if we look at the photophysical properties, all right, we have solution state uh, and solid film spectra. 
Um, we see that there's a bathochromic shift if one goes from the solution state uh, to the solid film, uh, indicating that we do get um, good intermolecular coupling here. Uh, there's the materials have a low uh, optical band gap, roughly one, one and a half uh, electron volts, a little bit more than that. Uh, we see two absorption bands, uh, one of which uh, relates to the uh, intramolecular charge transfer between the donor and acceptor, and the other uh, uh, shorter wavelength absorption band, uh, the pi pi start uh, transition from the oligothiophene unit. All right, and, and you can see uh, that there is some sylvatochromism as well uh, as we go from um, a fourth thiophene uh, to a sixth thiophene uh, analog. All right, so thermal properties. Um, the polymers are relatively stable. Uh, decomposition temperature ranges from about 350 to 450 degrees C. Uh, there's a melting and recrystallization temperature uh, that we see for both uh, the fourth thiophene and sixth thiophene analogs. Uh, and the thing that's interesting is for the sixth thiophene analog, we see that there's a mesophase where there are two melting transitions, uh, one at about 34 degrees, one uh, just above 200 degrees. Uh, and this indicates that there may be liquid crystalline characteristics in this material. Uh, in the range of roughly 70 to 150 degrees C. And this mesophase can provide some opportunities for processing, uh, which may induce uh, alignment of the change that could be favorable for charge transport. All right, and, and using um, biorefringence uh, from uh, polarized optical microscopy, uh, we have some limited evidence that, yes, there may be liquid crystalline characteristics in this material, but that's something that we need to investigate uh, further. All right, so looking at charge transport characteristics, uh, we can fabricate um, a traditional transistor device uh, with this material. Uh, we can uh, characterize those devices. And we can see whole mobilities that are as high as about 0.75 centimeters square per volt second. They're dependent upon the actual molecular structure. They're dependent upon the molecular weight of the system. And importantly, they're also dependent on the processing that we do uh, on the polymer so that we can, we can actually manipulate uh, the charge transport characteristics. Um, the performance also correlates with the molecular ordering of the system and that we've been able to confirm uh, using X-ray diffraction studies where enhanced molecular ordering uh, does lead to enhanced interchain charge hopping, uh, getting enhanced mobility. All right, um, so that's one aspect where manipulating uh, molecular structure, manipulating processing, we may be able to improve performance. All right, so are there some other ways uh, that we might be able to increase the absorption cross-section uh, of a traditional organic polymer device to improve um, efficiency, particularly in a photovoltaic cell? All right, and, and one thing that we've been thinking about and working on uh, in our group is the use of photon op conversion. All right, so Typically, um, you can get photon down conversion, um, phosphorescence. You see a, a Stokes shift, higher wavelength going to longer wavelength emission. All right, but using up conversion, what we're talking about is using an anti-Stokes shift where we were, we're taking um, absorption at a longer wavelength and then converting it to shorter wavelength, higher energy to be able to use that higher energy uh, emission to induce action in the actual device. All right, so there are a number of different applications for up conversion, and the one that we're particularly interested in is whether we can uh, develop an up conversion module, couple it to a photovoltaic in order to enhance efficiency. All right, so if we look at energy transfer processes, um, certainly we're starting with um, 
exposing a sensitizer uh, to light. Uh, we're going to have um, intersystem crossing uh, from the singlet state of the sensitizer to the triplet state. Uh, that then undergoes triplet triplet tra energy transfer to the triplet state of the emitter. Uh, then we have uh, two of the emitters are going to collide, and then we have triplet triplet annihilation where we have energy transfer to a sensitizer and then or to a singlet state, excited singlet state, and then the singlet state reverts back to the down state, emitting shorter wavelength light. All right, and typically this kind of a process has occurred in a liquid state. Um, liquids are not particularly easy to deal with if one wants to integrate a liquid into a device. Uh, there has been a fair amount of work in trying to incorporate um, up conversion systems into rubbery matrices. Uh, but from the previous slide, you can see that what we rely on uh, is diffusion of two triplet of the molecules. So we need to have two molecules come together and collide. Um, if you're in a rubbery polymer matrix, uh, they don't move very fast. So that process is not very efficient. So what can we do to be able to improve on the probability that two of these triplets are going to come together? and generate an excited state singlet uh, that will give us the, the light emission that we need. So we want to have systems that work with low power light and we want to have them highly efficient in order to have practical implementation. All right, so the concept that we came up with is the possibility of using sort of a core shell microcapsule using a microfluidic approach to develop that core shell system. All right, so this, it, we would have a solid uh, shell that would protect the system. Uh, it would provide a shield from the environment, uh, facilitate device integration, provide some mechanical strength. Um, it could be a polymer system that would give us some flexibility and also functionality. And then the liquid would be a mobile uh, core uh, that contains the uh, emitter uh, and the sensitizer, uh, allowing for relatively easy diffusion uh, so that we can have an efficient process. So how do we then actually develop such a system? All right, so we were using uh, microcapsule fabrication uh, using a microfluidic approach. Uh, we, as a, really just to establish um, that, yeah, you can do this, uh, we started with a platinum uh, tetraphenyl tetrabenzoporphyrin uh, with uh, this uh, phenylethinyl anthracene uh, as the emitter. All right, and you can see the absorption bands um, on uh, the, I guess, the left-hand side, your right-hand side. And then again, uh, the absorption energy transfer emission characteristics on the bottom. All right, so how do we do this? We start with an oil and water emulsion droplet. Uh, we flow it through uh, a tube and then in the direct while flowing through the tube, when we have these droplets, we irradiate them with UV light and then uh, that's how we form uh, the microcapsules. Um, that it's in a water phase uh, and then we also have the sensitizer in the water phase uh, and it uh, can migrate really just at the surface of the droplet as it's being formed and upon irradiation we then polymerize that shell. I, and, and depending on uh, the concentration and the time of polymerization uh, we can get um, control of the thickness of the shell and we can have anything from a very um, thin shell and a floppy uh, microcapsule to something which is basically solidified. All right, so if we look at photoluminescence, um, all those microcapsules cutting basically through the center uh, of those shells, 
Uh, we can see that as a function of curing time, uh, we do five minutes left. Okay, we can. I'll be done. We can uh, increase the thickness uh, of the shell, uh, and you can see the profile. Uh, and if we take a, an array uh, of these microcapsules, we can see that if we irradiate them, uh, we, we can see emission uh, of the microcapsules at a shorter wavelength. So what we're doing now uh, is really trying to understand uh, a little bit more about these systems and, and identify components where we can better control uh, the emission wavelength and match that emission wavelength to the spectra of um, conjugated polymers, conjugated systems that would be of interest uh, for uh, OPV devices. Uh, and then build these into modules that could be coupled into the OPV uh, such that uh, we may be able to improve the efficiency uh, of the photovoltaic itself. So just to summarize very briefly um, what uh, the premise that we're working under uh, is that um, molecular structure has to be looked at in conjugation, uh, in conjunction rather, uh, with materials processing because these together are going to influence electronic properties and device performance uh, and that's going to influence the, the final device architecture. All right, and there are certainly um, a number of aspects of material structure uh, that have to be controlled but it also has to be coupled to materials processing and characterization uh, in order to really understand and ultimately control on a large scale uh, what we have and be able to get it consistently. And also that materials can provide the basis uh, for a number of novel modules that we may be able to integrate uh, into device applications uh, that uh, could have um, an impact in the energy sector. All right, and certainly I have not done this work myself. Um, I do have to thank uh, my colleagues in particular, uh, my group members at Georgia Tech. Um, uh, the particular work that I talked about uh, today was largely uh, the work of Ji Huang Kang uh, and Boy Fu uh, with a little bit from a former postdoc, Zhao Kang Hu, uh, and uh, also I want to um, acknowledge interactions with uh, Professors Mohan Srinivasaro, uh, David Collard, and Laren Talbert. And thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>